I'm honored today to welcome Dr. Abul Hassan and Dr. Kenny for their grand rounds on popul population genomic health, bridging genomics and clinical care. Dr. Abul Hassan uh, received her medical degree from Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai and then continued on here for her residency in internal medicine and medical genetics. Um, her research focuses on integrating genomics broadly into clinical care and to drive therapeutic discovery. It was within this area that she has had multiple publications in leading journals, including Science and the New England Journal. She previously served as Director of Translational Genetics at Regeneron Genetics Center and now serves as Associate Professor of Medicine and Genetics here at Sinai and is the founding Clinical Director of the Center for Population Genomic Health. Dr. Kenny received her BA in Biochemistry from Trinity College in Dublin and her PhD in Computational Genomics from the Rockefeller University and completed her postdoc in Populations Geno Genomics at Stanford University. Dr. Kenny leads a multidisciplinary team focused on solving problems at the interface of genetics, ancestry, and medicine. She is the principal investigator in multiple NIH-funded consortia focused on genomic medicine and health. She has published over 70 papers in leading journals, including Science, Nature, Nature Genetics, and the New England Journal. Dr. Ker Kenny currently serves as an Associate Professor of Genetics and Genomic Sciences here at Sinai and is the founding director of the Center for Population Genomic Health. Please join me in giving a warm welcome today. Good morning and thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here in Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, it's going to be a little unusual today because both Nora and I are going to share the time to uh, give a talk and I lost the cone toss so I'm going first. <laughs> Uh, so first, some disclosures, as you can see on the slide, um, uh, disclosure of our relationship with various industry entities. Okay, so this morning we're going to talk about genomics, and I think it's fair to say that we are in the midst of a evolution or revolution, depending on how you want to think about it, in terms of genomic technology and how it's affecting us and our society and the impact of it into all sorts of industry and healthcare realms. Currently, I think there's an estimate something like 45 million humans are sequenced. The technology is precipitously dropping in price, so very soon, in a very short amount of time, that's going to be hundreds of millions. So, uh, and what it means is that uh, many different initiatives are being launched around the world uh, that are seeking to understand how we can best use genomics to improve the health of people, our species. And this is one initiative in the US that was launched uh, by our former president in 2015 called the Precision Medicine Initiative that seeks to sequence the genomes of a million Americans uh, from across the Americas and then follow them through their life, through their interactions with health systems, through other direct means to communicate through M health devices and understand how that information is going to impact them. So we can really think about already how that information is going to be used in the practice of medicine, uh, ways in which it is used today already or for the purposes of diagnostics, uh, for family planning. Uh, pretty soon, and, and you could even say, you know, it's already happening, we can think about using genetics for preventative health. Um, either if you've got a single variant that might impact your chance uh, for a high probability of having a disease, or in aggregate your, all, your whole genome in, in concert with everything else that's going on in your life in sophisticated models for risk prediction. And we do that in health systems, interacting with uh, physicians. Uh, people have options these days to do it direct to consumer, and I think there's something like 15 million uh, genomes in companies like Ancestry and 23andMe and for other things like pharmacogenomics. It seems like almost every day these days there is a launch of a new genomic medicine program. There was one that just came out this week. Uh, five million people from the UK in the NHS are going to have their genome sequenced. Uh, so I think it's, it's safe to say we are already in an era of genomic medicine. Uh, so there are going to be some challenges to overcome, and this is one of them. 
Uh, this it was, is an issue that was called out, in fact, yesterday in, in the Guardian newspaper in uh, the UK, uh, where genomics is really failing on diversity. In other words, most of the genomes in the genomic databases and medical knowledge bases that we are using as an engine to drive this idea of precision medicine or genomic medicine are biased toward being uh, European, actually more specifically biased toward being Northwestern European. <laughs> and so there's lots of questions about whether or not that information is going to be appropriate uh, to apply to non-Northwestern European people. Which leads to some of what uh, we think, Nora and I, some of the key driving questions today uh, that are going to be questions that we're going to need to tackle in the next uh, few years. One is how will inc this increase in number that in in includes uh, more and more genomes, but also more and more diversity of genomes, uh, impact clinical and research engines, uh, both for discovery of, of what genomes are doing and impacting health and then translating that into either therapeutics or clinical care. And then once we've found genes that are clinically relevant, how do we next find the populations at risk and, and what they're doing to impact health outcomes? And we can call this a genome first model of medicine. And then, and this is actually not a trivial one at all, how do we implement, integrate genomics broadly in health systems for improving healthcare management? And I think the answers to that are actually quite complex and nuanced. So let's think about a large health system. Let's think about our health system, uh, the Mount Sinai Healthcare Continuum, uh, which uh, covers the lives of nearly three to four million New Yorkers. And if you were to take a map of the five boroughs of New York and divide it into the 70 or so storied neighborhoods of New York, and then just paint them based on where our patients are coming from, you would get a map that looks something like this. And you see a concentration of patients that are close to our main hospital campus, but really the message here is that we have a reach into every corner, every neighborhood of the five boroughs of New York. Now let's think about that in terms of diversity. So this is one way of thinking about diversity. This is taking a view of the US Census. Uh, this is data from the 2010 US Census. And so here all I've done is taken the same 70 neighborhoods in New York and now I paint them using colors by whether or not there's a majority uh, race ethnicity group living in the neighborhoods uh, over 50%. And you can see that this map is quite colorful and as we know as New Yorkers, New York is very diverse. If I take that information and I just plot it in a pie chart, it's going to look something like this. So 33% of New Yorkers are uh, white or European ancestry, 26% uh, African American or black, 28% might be also Hispanic Latino, and 12% Asian, and about 4% mixed. And I always like to highlight that 4% mix. It's the thin slice of the pie, but in a city of 8 million people, that's hundreds of thousands of people who don't feel like they fit into that category. But of course, as we know, that's a very simplistic way to think about diversity in New York. And another way we can think about diversity is using genetics. So here is uh, about 32,000 New Yorkers in the, our health system, all as gray dots. And how close or how far away they are in this plot is how genetically similar or dissimilar they are. And, and just for your reference, I've also plotted it on here, uh, reference uh, populations from seven different continents around the world. So straight away that you see that we have a lot of global diversity in our health system. But the other thing that I want you to notice is it, it is not easy to put these people into discrete bins. And at least on a genetic scale, we should rather think of a continuum of genetic uh, diversity. So there's increasingly sophisticated ways that we can start to ask questions about the types of diversity. And here's another way that we work on in my lab. Uh, this is a way in which we think about diversity, also including genetic genealogy and our recent cousins. And in doing this and building networks like, you know, the kind of networks that you build on Facebook or Google, the same sort of underlying technology, then you can start to learn that there is over a hundred different communities of people with recent history 
history that are living together in New York, and then you can correlate that information with information like uh, self-reported race ethnicity, but also, also country of origin, or grandparental country of origin, or neighborhood, geopolitical location, or local uh, New York neighborhoods. And you can start to get a much more dynamic, nuanced picture uh, of the types of diversity in New York City. Uh, so using this kind of information and uh, using, importantly, genomes, uh, we can move from this sort of static course representation of diversity in New York City towards something that's much more nuanced. And then the exciting thing that we can do is we can link this to information about the physiology, etiology, and health of the individual, whether it's through our health records or increasingly in uh, using devices like mHealth. And of course, it won't surprise you to know that by learning about diversity and genetics and health in New York City, we are, in fact, learning about genetics and health on populations around the world. About 65% of New Yorkers can trace their grandparents to some country outside the US. So really, what we're learning about is not only New Yorkers, but, uh, but other countries around the world and the effects of uh, migration to the US. So uh, why is this important? Why is it so important to learn about this type of diversity? And the answer is because uh, diseases, particularly genetic diseases, tend to be very, very patterned by uh, the different demographics. And here is an example. Uh, and I love this example uh, because it's the first project that myself and Nora worked on uh, back in 2013. And it was a discovery that we made here in Mount Sinai. Uh, so this is the story of one variant in the genome, so one out of three billion bases that is changed in people uh, from Puerto Rico. And it was first discovered as a disease clinically in 1993 by Dr. Steele, so it's known as Steele syndrome. And it was discovered in a family for Puerto Rico, and these kids have clinical characteristics, including uh, short stature, born with very severe bilateral hip dislocation, and other sort of features of uh, spine and joint degradation. By looking at genomes of patients here in the Mount Sinai Health System, we learned that this variant, which was thought to be very rare, in fact, is not rare at all. And it's carried about 2% of people who have ancestry from Puerto Rico. You also tend to see it in the Dominican Republic, and you see it in Hispanic Latino New Yorkers here in New York City. Not surprisingly, we have a very substantial uh, Puerto Rican ancestry population in New York. So by learning that this is actually not a rare disease, it's quite common in our population, we can uh, postulate that this variant may be driving spine and joint degradation in quite a sizable amount of patients here in Mount Sinai. And we can, in fact, go to the health records of the people who are carrying the variants. And we can recapitulate, just using health records incidentally and retrospectively uh, gone, gone through in our health records, uh, that we see the same clinical features in people who are carrying two copies of this variant, as have been reported in the clinical literature. And uh, this is a paper that was published in uh, 2017, led by a postdoc in my lab, Gillian Belvin. And had I been a population genetics researcher in a department of genetics in Stanford University, that's where this story would have ended. Uh, but I wasn't. I was a population genetics researcher in the Institute of uh, uh, um, the Institute of Personalized Medicine, and my office was next door to Nora Abelhussen, who's a medical geneticist. And when I told her about this story, she said, well, we have to do something. Uh, so this is what we did. We uh, went to take a, a meeting with uh, the team in pediatric endocrinology and orthopedics, and we told them about what we found and what these uh, babies might look like. And they said immediately, I think I've seen a case. And then we went across the road to ATRAN, the other side, and we spoke with Lisa Edelman, and we said, hey, it, we, you know, we're just about to publish the paper. It's not out yet, but we do think that there's this important variant that you might need to start testing for. And she said, great, we're going to make a test. Within 12 weeks, we had a lab test for this variant. And we were start, and, uh, clinicians who were seeing these babies with severe hip dislocation were starting to refer these babies to medical genetic testing services and to medical genetic testing docs for um, counseling. 
so uh, that's great. And in fact, what that now has led to in 2018 is that this uh, variant is part of the newborn screening panel uh, in Puerto Rico. And we're working with collaborators there to get that test up and running. So uh, all babies now will be screened for this test. And we uh, anticipate about 30 new babies born a year in, in Puerto Rico. We anticipate we're going to have upwards of 10, 20 cases a year that are now caught. But what happens to all the adults who are walking around Mount Sinai who uh, also carry uh, this variant, also have these clinical features? As far as we know, because we've looked, nobody in their medical notes has ever had a diagnosis of Steele syndrome. Uh, as, far as, we've, as far as we know, at least not in this health system. And, it, and frankly, it's not at all surprising. This disease was relatively un obscure. There's maybe two papers in the medical literature about this disease describing it clinically. Uh, but it is important because we know that many of these patients are coming back to our health system as adults with severe problems due to spine and joint degradation, including coming in through the emergency room for emergency spine surgery. So we ought to be capturing these patients. We ought to be managing them better. And this was really one of the motivations to start the Center for Population Genomic Health. Um, and in, in this instance, what we really think we should be doing uh, is a genome first way to screen everybody in our health system ultimately so that we can start to capture uh, med variants that are actionable in our patients and start to tailor their healthcare management to those variants. And in this case, for Steele syndrome, we anticipate we're going to see thousands of patients in our health system with this variant. Uh, so in June 2018, we launched the Center for Population Genomic Health. Um, we think that this is a center for genomic health in probably one of the most diverse patient populations uh, compared to other efforts in this space. Uh, our goal here is for preventative medicine. So we want to have early detection and early intervention uh, for genetic diseases. And in doing so, hope to extend and improve our patients' lives. And with that, I'm going to pass to Laura. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Imer, for the great introduction to our Center for Population Genomic Health. We're very excited to tell you about it today. Um, very recently launched, and what I'll be describing in the next few slides and for the second half is some of our early initiatives uh, in population genomic health and where we think this might be leading. So I have this slide here to remind me to say that uh, this is a center that's really building upon and uh, relying on much of the internal ex expertise that already exists at Mount Sinai. Uh, and there are many different things on this slide, but there are also many things that are not represented here. Uh, but some of the things that I want to point out is our ability to make big genomic discoveries. Uh, as Imra has mentioned, there are many people making very clinically impactful discoveries across the health system uh, that we may be able to translate into clinical care very quickly. Um, <clears throat> we have the ability to perform clinical genomic testing through Semaphore, uh, and we also have expertise in genomic medicine implementation, especially in the pharmacogenetics realm. We have a BioMe Biobank, which I'm going to talk about in a little more detail as one of our uh, early efforts to implement population genomic health. Uh, and this is uh, one of the greatest resources that we've uh, really leveraged to make this happen. And we have our leadership in precision health. Uh, we have one of the biggest internal medicine departments uh, in the world. We have medical genetics expertise, including genetic counseling and genetic counseling training programs. And we have clinician champions across the health system that are very interested in genomics and in embracing a uh, future of genomic medicine. Uh, so all of this kind of comes together and enables us to build a center for population genomic health. So I want to talk about one of the first things that we've been doing and spend a little time describing what this looks like uh, in the BioMe Biobank. Uh, and the reason to do that is, you know, we need to pilot away and figure out pipelines and processes to return genomic results to individuals in the Mount Sinai healthcare system and see how that impacts their medical management. Uh, so I mentioned that we have a BioMe Biobank. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, this is a biorepository of now over 45,000 patients from across the healthcare system. This is where many uh, of our initial genomic discoveries have been made, as, as Imer has discussed, where Steele syndrome was first identified as being relatively common. 
Um, what happens when an individual signs up for the BioMe Biobank? First, these are patients that are recruited from across the healthcare system in a very unselected way. We're trying to be representative of our patient population and therefore of New York City and the world. Uh, patients, the only requirement to be a biobank uh, participant is to have uh, an MRN, to have interacted with the health system in some way. And everyone is consented uh, to provide us access to de-identified electronic health records, which enables us to do a lot of research that way, but also enables us to implement our, our genomic medicine programs. We have uh, samples from all these patients. These are blood samples that are usually provided from which we process uh, DNA and plasma. And we can then perform gen genetic studies on these samples uh, and also store them for future use. Our patients are also consented for recontact. Anyone who is interested in doing research uh, in BioMe can write an IRB protocol, get that approved, and recontact participants and uh, see if they will consent to their research study. So a hugely important resource that many uh, researchers across Mount Sinai have taken advantage of. And we now have over 31,000 individuals in the BioMe Biobank with whole exome sequencing data. Uh, this is through a collaboration with the Regeneron Genetic Center, where I was previously working before just returning here in May. And I'm very excited to announce today, probably for the first time, is that um, as of last week, on Friday to be precise, we are now IRB approved to return individual level genomic results to our BioMe participants. It's very exciting because this really transforms BioMe from a research entity into something that's translational, that's going to bring back medically actionable or clinically impactful results to our patients in a way that enables us to use that in their clinical care. So that's what I want to discuss for, uh, for a few slides, is this phase one of our Center for Population Genomic Health, where we're making a lot of effort to identify those participants among these individuals who have been sequenced, who have medically actionable results, and I'll explain what that means, in order to return these results to our participants for use in their <coughs> clinical care. So what are these medically actionable results? Um, I often get a lot of questions about this, uh, and it, there's some subjectivity involved in medical actionability. But we've started with a set of med medically actionable genetic variants in genes that have been vetted by the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. And the reason that these guidelines have come to be is that as more whole exome and genome sequencing uh, methods were being used clinically for diagnostic purposes, people realized that whenever you uh, sequence somebody, you're going to uncover things that are not necessarily related to the reason that they were sequenced in the first place. Those are secondary or incidental findings. And there was a lot of uh, controversy about what to do with those kinds of findings. And so uh, this uh, American College of Medical Genetics body uh, came together and put forth a consensus statement around recommendations to report actionable genetic findings uh, if they were incidentally fined. And this now applies to both clinical and research settings. Um, so what are these uh, medically actionable findings? They are germline variants in 59 genes that correspond to 27 different conditions uh, that for, wh for which there is an intervention that one could do in order to reduce or prevent serious uh, adverse events, so morbidity or mortality. So these are typically conditions for which we have a well-known uh, molecular etiology established and guidelines around which we can do something in a clinical setting to prevent uh, poor outcomes. The, uh, the first 27 conditions uh, were also chosen on the basis of their high penetrance, which means that if somebody has a variant in one of the genes listed uh, in, this, uh, in the ACMG 59, they are very likely to develop the associated condition. So we've used this as a starting point, um, but as I'll get to later, this is not the only type of medical act medically actionable result that we're interested in returning hard to our participants. So when we look at medical actionability, uh, we're assessing genes, we're assessing conditions, but then we're assessing at the granular level what variants in those genes are medically actionable. Uh, and typically today, variants are classified on a spectrum from benign to pathogenic. Uh, benign being <coughs> variants that are, have been shown not to be disease associated, and pathogenic having really strong evidence that they are disease associated. In a clinical setting, likely pathogenic and pathogenic variants are typically treated the same way, where the likely pathogenic has a little bit of uncertainty, uncertainty with it, and I'm not going to go through all the reasons why, but um, there's enough evidence 
to say that these are likely to be disease associated and people often refer to them as expected pathogenic variants. So what we're looking for is these types of variants, the pathogenic and the likely pathogenic variants, which maybe don't have uh, the, the same body of evidence around them, but are very likely to be disease associated in our individuals who have been sequenced in the biobank today. I'm not going to go through the, all the 27 conditions in the ACMG, but I'm going to focus on these three medically actionable conditions. And I've put a table here so that everyone is familiar with these and knows what genes are associated with them. Uh, I suspect that many of you in this audience know what these are. So one of the most uh, well-known uh, genomic syndromes is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer uh, with the genes BRCA1 and BRCA2 driving these. Uh, uh, these types of cancers. In addition to breast and ovarian cancer, which happen early in individuals, they're also at risk for pancreatic prostate cancer and melanoma. And of course, there are targeted screening and prophylactic interventions. This is also true for a condition called familiar hypercholesterolemia, which uh, causes increased risk of early onset coronary artery disease and stroke, uh, and for which lipid lowering therapy is, uh, is very beneficial and can, uh, can reduce morbidity and mortality. And Lynch syndrome is another uh, cancer syndrome with four genes associated. Uh, there are actually more, but four that we look at in exome sequencing. And this is associated with early onset colorectal cancer as well as multiple other cancers. And again, there are screening measures that can be undertaken in, in early management of precancerous changes that have been well known and well shown to reduce morbidity and mortality. The reason that we've started to focus on these three conditions also in particular is that uh, the CDC currently recognizes these as the tier one genomic conditions. Um, and what that means is that there is enough evidence now <clears throat> to support, excuse me, <clears throat> and there's enough evidence now to support it, widespread implementation of genomic screening in clinical care for these three conditions. And that's akin to something that most people will be familiar with, uh, which is newborn screening. And as, as most of you will know, newborn screening is something that we do in every state in the United States um, to some degree because there's so much evidence around uh, the benefit of newborn screening. So these are three conditions that other people have also looked at uh, in, uh, in these kinds of biobanks and return of results programs. And we're very interested in understanding what they look like and what the prevalence is of these conditions in biome. So I want to share with you some of our early observations <laughs> of uh, for these three conditions. Uh, so this table is showing the conditions and the genes associated with them again. And here's the number of known and likely pathogenic variants for each condition. Um, this is grouped together. So there are 106 variants, for example, in BRCA1 and BRCA2. <clears throat> the next column is the number of individuals who are harboring one of these expected pathogenic variants. So you can see for BRCA1 and BRCA2, there are 227 individuals today in our biobank who have been sequenced who have one of these variants that are medically actionable, which gives us an estimated prevalence of 1 in 136. For familiar hypercholesterolemia, that number is 117, prevalence is about 1 in 260, and for Lynch syndrome, 48 carriers and a prevalence of 1 in 640. If you add all of this up, we have currently a prevalence in biome of one in approximately 80 individuals harboring a pathogenic variants in one of these conditions. And I want to pause here because I really think that that's a very striking number. There are more than 80 people, I think, in this room. Uh, and if this represents our pop patient population, then that means that you know, somebody in here may be at risk for one of these conditions and may not know it. I also want to point out that uh, this is pretty consistent what, with what others have seen. Uh, in my previous role at Regeneron, I was working closely with a different biobank at the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania called MyCode. Uh, and similar prevalence overall was found for these three conditions. Uh, actually, a very strikingly similar prevalence was found, which made me go back and count this several times. Uh, and, um, but <laughs> I really didn't look at it beforehand. Uh, the, the reason this is also very striking to me is that although the total prevalence is 1 in 78 uh, in my code, the prevalence for each of these conditions is quite different. Uh, in familiar hypercholesterolemia, it was about the same, 1 in 200 250. Uh, for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, a paper was just published from my code uh, with a prevalence uh, a pr uh, after this preliminary results uh, quoted as 1 in 190. Our prevalence is a 1 in 136. So these differences, we want to try to explain in our population. Uh, and I should point out that the Geisinger MyCode 
uh, biobank is predominantly uh, European descent. So if, if we showed that plot next to what Emer was showing, you would really see people clustered all the way on the European American side and uh, almost no one else uh, among 50,000 people. So that can certainly account for some of our differences. And I'll show you what that looks like for BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, where, again, this difference was extremely striking to us. Uh, so when we looked a little bit more closely, uh, we focused on individuals with Ashkenazi Jewish descent, and, and we've looked at various populations and the prevalence of these variants in our different populations now. But if we use uh, Emer and her group have methods to really dissect out individuals with a genetic ancestry, uh, and we have, using these methods, over 4,240 individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent in our Biomi Biobank who have been sequenced. It's well known that there's a high frequency of three variants or founder mutations in uh, individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, um, and those are listed here. They are BRCA1, two variants, and, and one in BRCA2. So what happens if we look at the prevalence uh, of pathogenic or expected pathogenic BRCA1 and 2 variants in, in these individuals alone? Uh, so again, the results are very striking. So that we have a total of 92 individuals harboring one of these uh, expected pathogenic variants. Among those, I should point out that 81 are harboring one of these three variants that are considered to be found in mutations in this population. Uh, so the total estimated prevalence in this population alone is 1 in 46. And I should point out that this is uh, a population that has been very well studied uh, for BRCA1 and 2 variants uh, that we know very well here at Mount Sinai with our cancer genetics program. Um, and this, this result is entirely consistent with what's known in the literature uh, from global estimates in the Ashkenazi Jewish population which really tells us that we can use our biobank as a microcosm of diversity in the world to try to understand these kinds of numbers and make more global representations of prevalence of these diseases uh, around the world. So I want to go through what a return of results program looks like. Uh, we have these biome samples. They've undergone exome research sequencing. Um, and that research part is important because, as I mentioned, we want to take this from a research entity to something that can be used in clinical care. So what does that mean? Uh, we use our approach to, which involves bioinformatics and some manual curation as well, to identify actionable genetic results. Uh, I'll start here where it's simple. For most of our participants, we will not identify an actionable genetic result. We expect that we'll find something in up to 3 to 5% of Biomi participants, not more. Uh, that's, of course, only using that ACMG 59 list, um, which we'll, we'll just end that there. But as we increase what we want to report back to individuals, of course, that number would increase too. So if we don't find anything, we still have the exome sequence data, we can always revisit that. As we add more genes to our list, as more data and knowledge comes to light, we can always revisit exome sequence data and uh, decide if there's more that's actionable there. If we do find an actionable genetic result, then we have to clinically confirm that result. So a sample has to be sent to a New York State approved CLIA certified lab, a clinical lab, that will perform a genetic test for that variant that's been identified to confirm it. Uh, once that's done, oh, I should mention, sometimes that's not clinically confirmed. The lab will interpret that variant, and if that variant interpretation is not consistent with the expected pathogenicity from our approach, then there's no result to be returned. Only a clinically confirmed genetic result gets reported back. Um, and in that case, a clinical report is generated by the lab, and the participant is invited for a return of result visit through the Center for Population Genomic Health. And that entails, of course, a very careful communication of a genetic result by a trained genetic counselor. Um, this will in involve a condition-specific evaluation uh, that includes obtaining a very detailed personal family history. And then we follow up with recommendations. What do you do with that genetic result? Our purpose is not to give back results to individuals and not have them know what to do with that information. So what we've been doing in the meantime is speaking to clinicians in different specialties who may be seeing these patients from a genome-first perspective and understanding what they would want to see and how they would want to follow up these patients so we can decide what our strategies will be for long-term follow-up, further evaluation, and testing. And I want to go through this in a little bit of detail. I do have time. 
Um, because this is a genomics first approach and typically people are not used to seeing patients uh, without a sign or a symptom of a disease. Sometimes we do see patients in the genetics world who have family history of disease uh, and this is a little bit like that. But in this case we're starting with a variant. So we've identified something that we consider to be medically actionable. As I, and as I mentioned this triggers a gene or context specific evaluation that includes a history, physical exam, uh, testing, for example, for familial hypercholesterolemia, we would check lipid levels in these individuals, uh, and consultation with specialists. There are going to be some cases in those uh, three first buckets where a diagnosis of a genomic syndrome is made with the initial evaluation and testing. Um, so I'll go through these, and then there are going to be some where the diagnosis is not made initially. So in uh, the first scenario, Individuals may have had previous clinical genetic testing, uh, and I'll show you what that might look like in, in another example later on. Uh, so those individuals are presenting for return of results, but actually have a knowledge of a clinical genotype and they know their phenotype. So genotype plus, phenotype plus. In the second scenario, they've not had clinical genetic testing, however, they do have the phenotype. So this would be somebody uh, in the familial hypercholesterolemia example who uh, comes for their initial return of results visit and have a family history of early CAD, of very high LDL levels, have been on lipid lowering therapy their whole lives. Um, so that's consistent. In the third scenario, people may appear to a return of results visit without a phenotype that they know of, but upon taking that detailed personal and family history, that phenotype does emerge, in which case, again, the genomic syndrome is diagnosed. Uh, and those are the three kind of easiest scenarios. And then we go over here where that's not really the case. So no genomic syndrome is identified individual, in individuals at their initial visit uh, in scenario number four. But these patients get followed over time. And we discuss this with the specialists who are going to follow patients. What would you do if someone has a risk variant in MEN2? What are the next steps, for example? And maybe if this patient's followed more carefully and screening guidelines are, are kept, their phenotype does emerge over time. So then again, the genomic syndrome has been made. The trickiest part is when the genomic syndrome does not emerge over time. So that genotype positive, phenotype negative, despite follow-up, despite recommendations being followed. And this will happen sometimes because despite the high penetrance of these conditions, the penetrance is not 100%. Uh, so we are going to see this and that's probably going to be the trickiest bucket of patients that we have to deal with in a health system. I should mention that this slide was adapted from Michael Murray, who uh, led the Genome First program at the Geisinger, which was one of the first uh, genomic medicine programs in the country. Uh, and I really like this quote from this paper in 2016 saying, your DNA is not your diagnosis. And I think this really is the take home message that uh, the genetic component is but one component of clinical care. We want it to supplement what we already do really well. We want to use genomics to make earlier diagnoses, but when someone's identified with a genomic variant, that does not make them have the diagnosis in every case. So all of this is being done so that we can really build an infrastructure for genomic medicine here at Mount Sinai. And that entails many different steps, and I'm just going to go through a few of them here uh, that some I've mentioned already. For example, generating clinical results from something that's a research entity. Uh, eventually, we would hope that clinical genomic screening becomes something that we do here. We are gaining genetic counseling expertise in this type of genomic screening, uh, and that's going to be very important in the future and establishing guidelines around these kinds of genomics first findings. So what are some of the strategies, strategies for evaluating individuals with, uh, with a genetic variant? What should we do in terms of long-term follow-up and management? Uh, cascade screening of at-risk relatives is a really important point uh, and one that's been very impactful in other areas of the world, not so much in the United States today. Again, I'll use the familial hypercholesterolemia example where if one individual is found to have familial hypercholesterolemia by genetic testing, uh, so they have a variant that's been identified, then you can assume that every first degree relative of that proband or that first individual is at 50% risk of having the same variant. So then you can do targeted testing of first degree relatives and then their relatives if they're positive and that's the cascade screening and that all becomes clinical care. So once we have a clinical genetic result that's been returned to a participant, we encourage them to tell their family members that they've been identified as having that and to uh, undergo genetic counseling and clinical genetic testing for that specific variant. 
we need to scale our best practices for genomic medicine at Mount Sinai. And this involves a lot of outreach. And I've been very fortunate to be speaking to many clinicians and different specialties about, again, what would you do with patients who are presenting with a genomics first finding? Uh, and how can we start to write the guidelines around these different genes and diseases? And finally, something that always comes up is what's the clinical utility of a widespread genomic screening program? And I have to say there's not uh, enough evidence today for clinical utility in broad genomic screening and clinical care because it just hasn't been done. This is something that we need longitudinal data to really properly assess. And the things we want to look at are patient outcomes. Is this going to improve our diagnosis and our management of patients, reduce morbidity and mortality? What do patients do with our recommendations? Will they adhere to recommendations, especially in scenarios where they don't have signs and symptoms of the disease? We're starting to gather some data from across the country about what this will look like, but we certainly want to be uh, making uh, some assessment of clinical utility here. These are findings, again, that will impact family members. When we identify a genetic variant in one individual, that means their family is also at risk. What is the impact on families? What is the impact on societies? We identify variants that may be segregating at very high frequency in specific populations, like the BRCA1 and 2 variants in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. That will impact different societies and populations in New York. What will that look like? <coughs> And finally, cost. That's going to be a big thing to think about. Um, we have to determine what are the costs of healthcare utilization associated with genomic medicine. Is there a cost benefit down the line? We expect that this will look like something that, pre that preventative health measures look like uh, and would hope that there's a cost benefit to it. So I want to give a couple of examples um, of not exactly clinical utility, but at least where this has been successful. Uh, and this is coming from the MyCode Biobank, where BRCA1 and 2 screening was performed in this Geisinger population that's predominantly European American. And interestingly, among 267 carriers that were found to be carrying a pathogenic variant, 82% had not had clinical genetic testing. I thought that this was really striking, uh, and I think we can expect to see similar things today. As when you screen broadly a population, you find that the prevalence is going to be higher than expected, and most people are not going to have been diagnosed with a gene genetic condition. Among those who had not had prior clinical genetic testing, 50% approximately did, would not meet current guidelines today for referral to genetic counseling, and those guidelines are what insurance would use to reimburse uh, genetic testing. So, they just would have been missed, and that's half of the carriers. I thought that was also very striking. This is one example of an individual who received her genetic result, and this was a pathogenic variant in BRCA1. Uh, this is the individual over here. She was 56 at the time, and she didn't really have a family history that would meet current guidelines for referral to genetic counseling. She'd been following her doctor's recommendations for screening mammograms. Those were normal. And this is what that path looks like from disclosure of the genetic result, uh, and this was an individual who actually followed recommendations through uh, and ended up receiving a risk-reducing re salpingo ophorectomy uh, over at Geisinger. Uh, I show her story because she actually came public with this, and I think this was a great example of what a success story would look like and what we would like to see here at Mount Sinai. Uh, so this is Barbara Barnes. She wanted to do something about her genetic finding because she had grandchildren that she was raising and wanted to be around for the next 15 years to make sure that she raised them. So she, she went through the genetic counseling and all the care that was recommended, ended up uh, having her surgery and was found to have a stage 1C fallopian tube cancer. As many of you know, it's very rare. Uh, to diagnose ovarian or fallopian tube cancers very early on, so this was a win. Uh, she completed chemotherapy and is expected to continue to have an excellent outcome. So what are we going to find here in genomic medicine? Uh, Emer went through a really exciting story of SEAL syndrome and what we found here, and again, that prevalence is going to be something that I think is going to be a recurrent theme. Genetic diseases are not as rare as we think. They're going to be more prevalent when we start to broaden screening in unselected populations. And what's more, we're going to find that they're not diagnosed routinely. Uh, the other example that I'll give is a familiar hypercholesterolemia, which is something that I worked on uh, with Geisinger and Regeneron. Again, the prevalence was much higher than we expected to find, and that really set a precedence uh, with almost double the prevalence of what previously was thought to be the global prevalence of FH. The FH also was underdiagnosed, as I mentioned, and I think this was a really important point, this last one, is that it was undertreated. And using electronic health records and going back into charts and seeing the patients in return of results, 
uh, we were able to discover that only 58% of individuals with a genetic FH were treated with a statin. And among those who were treated, less than half were meeting an LDL goal of less than 100, uh, which may be hard to achieve, but there are medications that one could take to improve uh, these numbers. So importantly, we need to do uh, more to prepare our next generation of providers for genomic medicine. And this is something uh, that I've been thinking about, <clears throat> that Imar has been thinking about for a long time. Um, I had a medical student uh, who, was, uh, who graduated from here recently uh, perform this survey across the medical school years to assess the interests and attitudes and knowledge about what we were calling personalized medicine at the time. And uh, strikingly, there were almost 80% of our medical students who were very interested in personalized medicine. Uh, but across the years, there were only 6% who felt that their medical ed education was preparing them for this future, for this new era of, of personalized medicine. Um, I think we can do better than that, and, and we're thinking about strategies to improve genomics education and training here. We, I should also mention these are similar findings across the country in medical students, physicians, trainees, like residents and fellows, and attending. So we're not doing a worse job than anyone else, uh, but I think we can do more. Uh, and I want to point out also that 36% of our medical students only felt that they knew enough about direct-to-consumer genetic testing to be able to interpret those results. Uh, and Ima mentioned how this is something that we really need to consider as part of what we do in clinical care. Uh, so I'll show you some of my direct-to-consumer genetic <laughs> testing. <laughs> this is uh, my 23andMe results uh, for BRCA1 and 2. Very exciting. No variants are detected. Um, however, if you read the fine print, uh, this is a test from 23andMe that's looking at those three common variants in individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Uh, I'm not of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, so actually these results are almost meaningless to me. Uh, and you could imagine that uh, I'm you know, relatively savvy, I think, in genomics, but someone who's looking at this report may not read, <laughs> I hope, <laughs> may not read that fine print uh, and may not understand the limitations of this kind of test. And, uh, you, and the worry that I would have is that an individual with a striking family history of breast and ovarian cancer does this kind of testing on their own and interprets the results to mean that they're not at risk. And that would be uh, a terrible thing to happen. So we don't want that to happen. Another thing that we don't have, want to happen is uh, this scenario that was recently in the New York Times. Uh, and this is, again, uh, actually an individual from New York City, not me this time, uh, who is quite savvy and had received 23andMe results. And what you can do with those kinds of results is take the raw data and upload, upload them into a third-party company like Prometheus, and they will generate a clinical, well, it's not clinical, but they will generate a health report for you. Uh, so he did that, uh, expecting not to find anything, and of course uh, was distraught when he found that he had a pathogenic variant in PSEN1 or presinolin one This is a gene that predisposes individuals to early onset Alzheimer's disease occurring usually, well, before the age of 65, often at age 40, and he was 32. So he was not pleased with, uh, with that news, and, uh, and PSEN1 is actually thought to be 100% penetrant. So, uh, he actually went to doctors and, and didn't find much help there, so he did another direct-to-consumer test through Ancestry, did the same thing, took his results, put them in Prometheus, and now he didn't find that, that same pathogenic uh, variant at the top of the list. So he looked through, and that variant was now being called benign. Um, so he wanted to be reassured by that, but he had two discrepant reports, and that can be very conflicting as well. Um, so I wonder what would our physicians today do if this were their patients. Uh, these are the kinds of patients that are going to be coming more and more to primary care, uh, and we need to know how to deal with them. He eventually was able to convince uh, a physician, I don't know uh, what kind of physician that was from the article, uh, to order a clinical genetic test, which was negative, and, and now feels that he's put the, t put the issue to rest. So this is a changing par paradigm. Uh, I read a statistic recently, uh, well, a couple years ago, so this might not be entirely accurate, but there are very few medical geneticists per million population, um, which is good news in some ways because I have some job security, but it also means that we cannot be relying on the medical genetics profession to sustain an era of genomic medicine, especially when there are a hundredfold or more uh, primary care physicians per million population. There are now over 4,000 genetic counselors in the U.S. and Canada, which is great. That number has been increasing and is expected to increase by 30% over the next 10 years. 
There are over 74,000 commercially available genetic tests in the US alone, and there are 14 new tests that enter the market daily. Um, this makes me nervous as a medical geneticist, so I can only imagine what individuals who don't feel as comfortable with genetics might feel. Um, but really, what I think all of this put together means is that genomics needs to become something that's not so scary, not alone in the research world, but accessible to physicians in every specialty, uh, from primary care to our specialties across health systems. Um, and I'm going to end here, uh, but I hope that none of you are of this mind. <laughs> and uh, I'll let uh, Emer take the last slide. Uh, so we're going to finish up there, but we would like to acknowledge that uh, Nora and I are both faculty at the Institute of Personalized Medicine and be working closely with Judy Cho, who is the director there on a lot of these initiatives. And since we launched uh, the new Center for Population Genomic Health, we're increasingly working with, with many people across the health sy care system here, uh, most of whom uh, we spoke about during the talk, but or maybe not in this slide, but I do want to highlight Barbara Murphy is the chair of medicine, Adam Margolin the chair of genetics, and folks uh, at uh, uh, Semaphore that we've been uh, working very closely with to build some of the infrastructure that we have described. Thank you. So that was really a great talk and you laid out the link between genomics and disease conditions that aren't diagnosed. How, how are you doing with moving to understanding diseases that have been diagnosed and response to therapies and issues? I know that was started a, a while ago here at Sinai. Are you moving ahead in that direction as well? <coughs> Pharmacogenomics. Sorry? It's a, it's pharmacogenomics. Oh yeah, so great question. Um, Pharmacogenomics uh, was something I used to be more involved in, but uh, what, we've, what we've been very successful at doing through the Institute for Personalized Medicine is implementing pharmacogenomics programs in our internal medicine associates and faculty practice associates in primary care uh, for, as a research program, so for uh, participants who have been consented to, for the use of PGX in their care. Uh, and the way we've done that successfully is to actually integrate results from pharmacogenetics into the electronic health record at the time point of care. So when a physician is about to make a prescription, uh, if that patient is part of the pharmacogenetics program and has a variant that would result in a different prescribing decision from that physician, they would get an alert, which clearly states what, that, what the reason is and what the recommendation would be. Uh, and uh, again, I'm not as involved in that program today, but we have had much success and, and others as well have, have done a lot in the pharmacogenetics realm uh, to improve the way we use, we use PGX today in practice. I wanted to add my congratulations to your work and the education you've shared with us today. And I have a question. It's about what controls the age at which this genetic defect shows up. My guess would be the answer resides in uh, cellular aging, not getting old, but the Hayflick cellular aging phenomenon. But I'd rather hear your answer. Do we, are we looking at what controls the age at which these things appear? So I think, um, I think that's quite variable depending on the gene and the defect, uh, the tissue expression and things like that. Um, I'll give the FH example, it's one of my favorites, but uh, in, in familiar hypercholesterolemia, it's often a defect in the LDL receptor, so we have problems with LDL clearing. Uh, that actually is thought to start being a problem in utero, and the current recommendations are to start pediatric patients with FH on a lipid-lowering therapy by age eight. So things can happen very early, even for what are considered um, these you know, more common genomic uh, syndromes. Uh, there are others that have much more specific ages of onset, uh, like early onset Alzheimer's, which is depending on the accumulation of plaque. Uh, it really depends on, on the disease, so I don't think there's one answer to that question today. But I think uh, part of uh, the effort that we are describing is that we're going to start to gather empirical evidence that's going to teach us a lot. So in, in addition to learning about what's happening to the patient, we will learn about the course and the progression of these diseases. So for example, the Steele syndrome disease that uh, we didn't discover, <laughs> people knew about it, just it was quite obscure. 
We know that if you have two copies of that defective gene, you, the kids are born with severe hip dislocation, but the, the course of the progression of the disease can be very different in different children. And furthermore, it's thought to be this recessive disease that you need two copies. If we actually go and look at the people who have one copy, we see similar signs and symptoms of the disease, not in everyone. So there's clearly something going on where different people are impacted differently. And we will start to gather evidence for what that looks like as part of this program. You, you opened up by talking about the diversity of what Mount Sinai is doing in this area. And then you talked about what Geisinger Medical Center is doing in Northeast Pennsylvania. Um, and the uh, population there has changed drastically in the past 10 to 15 years. So how do you deal with sampling bias in looking at Geisinger uh, versus what you're doing? Yeah, yes, great question. I love that question. Uh, so you, you have to be rather careful. You can't naively translate or transfer findings from a center like Geisinger through time within Geisinger and then also across from Geisinger to a health system like New York, our, our patients look different, our health system is different, access is different. So you have to actually build that into how you're interpreting. And Nora had a comment that I think is very important that genomics is a component of clinical care. DNA is not your diagnosis. So we have to actually build that fuller picture. Um, I think that you know, from our point of view, both as a health system and, and my bias as a researcher, I think we're going to learn things here that other people don't have an opportunity to learn, uh, both from a discovery potential and a translation potential. Thank you very much.